The teachings of General Conference are the considerations the Lord would have before us now and in the months ahead. Our marching orders for each six months are found in the General Conference addresses. For the next six months, your conference edition of the Ensign should stand next to your standard works and be referred to frequently. I encourage you to read the talks once again and to ponder the messages contained therein. I exhort you to study the messages of this conference frequently, even repeatedly, during the next six months. You're listening to the Conference Talk podcast, where it's conference weekend every weekend. Each weekend, we discuss talks from the most recent General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's right. We'll share some insights, make some connections, and have a ton of fun as we study the words of the awesome men and women God has called to direct His Church in these the latter days. I'm Matthew Watkins. And I'm Richard Bernard. In this episode, we're talking about Elder Stephen R. Bangeter, talk of foreordained to serve. Boy, what a talk it was. Yes. Yeah, it, it's quite a talk. I've listened to it several times, not in preparation for this necessarily, but uh, I've listened to it several times, and um, yeah, there's some great, great moments here in this talk. Yeah, Elder Bangerter, when he spoke, I, distracted by kids, obviously, but also his name. I had a, I had a missionary on my mission with that last name, Elder Bangerter. I don't know if he's related or not, but that I, I, I remember the last name more in the talk at the time, which is sad because this is a gem of a talk. Um, a little bio about Elder Bangerter, reading on his biography at the church. He's uh, yet another 70 that used to be a lawyer, is basically how that works out there. Um, he served in various church callings, including full-time missionary in the Canada-Vancouver mission, ward young men's president, elders quorum president, high counselor, bishop, counselor in the state presidency, state president, and then area 70. And he was serving in the fifth quorum of the 70. So I, don't, I think I think we get up to seven quorum 70, but I think we might go over that. Anyways, he was from the fifth quorum of the 70 in the Utah South area at the time of his call uh, as a general authority on March 31st, 2018. So he was called and uh, right about the same time that President Nelson was coming in as president of the church, it looks like. And they have six kids. What's really cool is as a, as a lawyer, it says his legal career is focused on representing churches and other faith-based organizations. Now, I, I doubt that those are the uh, legal clients that have uh, the most means to pay. So <laughs> I'm going to take that as a, as a look into his heart. This is a good dude. He starts off, says, for Latter-day Saint young men, missionary service is a priesthood responsibility. And I think it ties into, because of the priesthood, we have a responsibility for missionary work. And in the Book of Mormon, they... Several of the prophets, in I think all of them, say that I want my garments to be spotless, to be clean, and not have your sins of this community on me. It zeroes in. I know he's talking about young men, but I, I believe the fact is you and I are also have that responsibility, even though we're not directly called. Now, my mission, I'm not a, a proselyting missionary. I'm an educational missionary. But I think all the males in the church have this responsibility, a missionary responsibility. Yep, and he, he reaffirms President Nelson's um, very strong wording from two years ago, where President Nelson repeated something that has fallen out of fashion in the church, that indeed every young man that's worthy and able has a responsibility to serve a mission. But to the sisters, it is optional. And they should be praying to ask if they should go on a mission that is not what the prophets are asking the young men to do. They're telling us what yes. we we're supposed to do. Yes. And, and boy, that I remember when he said that there was vitriol and outrage galore from many in the church who said, well, if it's optional for the sisters, it should be optional for me. And who's he to tell me, you know, what God, <laughs> wa- whether or not God wants me to serve. It's like, oh, he's a prophet, Sir and Revelator. So I, I think that's his authority. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, he is the prophet, seer, and revelator. And I can't remember, I'd have to look up who said it, but one of our apostles said, if we can't follow the president, our prophet, with little things, we won't be able to follow him with the big things. Mm -hmm. And this is a little thing. When you think about it, they think, okay, and I love what you just said, that the sisters, it's optional. Why isn't it optional for me? And I've heard over the years, I've been a member of the church for quite a long time, 
And um, I've heard many people say, these are old guys. They don't understand the world today. They don't really understand what's going on. And and so... Boy, that makes me angry every time I hear it. Yes, yes, because... It gets my blood boiling a little. <laughs> I, I, I feel the same way because I'm going, these men know more about what's going on than you think they do. And they are prophets, seers, and revelators. And so it's not so much the world knowledge they have, although I'm amazed at how much they keep up with even technology and, and, and the use of technology. But they're prophets, seers, and revelators, and they go to a school far different than the worldly schools. And they know what's going to happen, and we need to listen to them even with the small things. So, yes, th this is this talk here. It's very direct. <laughs> I'm looking at it here again. Okay. And it's, it goes on to say that the young men have been reserved for this time when the promised gathering of Israel is taking place. And this is where he pivots. It, it surprised me because this talk is about foreordination. And he starts by directing to the youth and talking about the concept of preordination. And then this whole thing about missions almost seems like an aside. It's a little jarring. It's a little out of place. Like, why are we talking about missions? And then he weaves it back in and says, the reason I'm bringing these two quotes from President Nelson, one about your premortal existence and one about your mission, is because, and he goes on to say, our prophets' references to the Lord holding youth of our day in reserve for the time when the gathering of Israel and his invitation to pray to know what the Lord would have you do are in part references to the life you lived and blessings you received from God before you were born on this earth. This whole talk, I don't think we as members of the church often realize how radical a doctrine it is to believe in a pre-existence, in a pre-mortal life. Have you had experiences with that? Um, no, I, 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 at least me personally, I can't think of a situation, but I, I believe firmly. I mean, when that was said, I go, yeah, that's right. <laughs> it just felt right. That, um, and, and in fact, uh, if, if one goes to the gospel library and goes to that talk and taps on the three dots in the upper right hand corner, they get the related content. And, um, I went uh, number 13 says topics and questions for ordination. And uh, then it referred me to Jeremiah 1.5 and what is the relationship between for ordination and agency. And so I read all of that. In fact, I went, um, I tapped on all the, the scriptures that are in that related content. And I found it very interesting because another one, number 10, is premortal life overview. And all of this is right in the Gospel Library. If people would just open up the Gospel Library, go to this talk, and go to related content. I found it fascinating. I really did. Yeah, general authorities, they hide amazing stuff in those footnotes. Yes. <laughs> and um, I just, I always go to the footnotes. I always look at the scriptures for priesthood when we're, you know, the topic is a, a conference talk. I'm the one that goes to all the scriptures and reads all the scriptures and looks all the, the side notes and everything because um, there's a lot of information there. Yeah, they, they said Jesus hid his most powerful teachings from the wise and prudent by layering them deep down in parables. Yes. See, nowadays, they don't do it like that. They just put it right there, but it's in the, in the footnotes where they know that you know, a lot of light skimming people aren't going to yeah. take a look at that. <laughs> and, and I have access to the analytics of this app, and I happen to know that most people don't go to the related content. Um, yep. and, it, and if you scroll all the way down to the end of the talk in the Gospel Library, um, it's got um, topics. And uh, one of them is for ordination. And when I click on that, it takes me to three talks by Bangator. Neil A. Maxwell and Bruce R. McConkie, uh, talks that they gave on uh, being foreordained. And so I went into those talks, and I, I love Neil A. Maxwell. He just has a way of saying things that just hit me right between the eyes. <laughs> and um, so just encourage people, <laughs> encourage people to scroll all the way down to the bottom and look at this premortal existence is another one. And uh, divine nature. Yeah, he, he talks about 
what our true identity is. And, and I, I, I've always considered that important, to understand, like the primary song says, I am a child of God. That is a concept, and I think you alluded to it, or maybe you said it directly here just a few minutes ago, that most of the world doesn't understand that, that we are literally his children. In fact, the talk that Elder Bednar gave in this, in this uh, particular conference from April, he says, we need to know that God is our Father, that we are his children, and that the Savior is our Redeemer. And that just sums things up beautifully, that we were in a pre-existence. And, and, and I've often thought about the pre-existence because I was not born in the church. My wife was, she's a Woodruff, and her, uh, Wilfred Woodruff is Is that her, like a common member name? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she, uh, let's see, she's the great, great I think three greats, three great um granddaughter of, of Wilfred Woodruff. And so her whole family, obviously, are Woodruffs, and, and they just go back to the pioneers and, you know, Wil, Wilfred himself. <clears throat> and I thought, how come I wasn't born in a family like that? Instead, I was born in a family that the parents divorced quite early. Um, my father was a, a, a Lutheran minister, and they divorced, and he was alcoholic, I discovered, many years later. And then during key parts of my life, um, my grandparents were raising me and um, discovered the church because I started dating someone that was a member of the church. And then eventually after we got married, I joined. <clears throat> but I think, how come I wasn't born in the Wilford <laughs> family? <laughs> or the, the, there's a bunch of names out there. The Bangator family would be fine. But, uh, and... I'm wondering, what did I do in the pre-existence? Did I not do everything I should have done? Or did I say, oh, yeah, yeah I don't need to be born in a, a, a family that has a strong line. Um, I'm Just send me where you want. <laughs> so I, I'm, I really would like to know how, the, how all of this works because there are people born um, in China who have never even heard of Jesus Christ and never will. They're in communist China. Um, religion is not taught there. And yet Heavenly Father loves all his children. And of course they won't be held accountable as you and I are. And salvation is available for them and will be made and all the temple ordinances will be made available for them. But I'm just wondering why we are born into the situations we are. Well, we know that it's not by chance. As I was reading Elder Bangader's talk about foreordination, I was strongly impressed to go back to a talk that President Nelson gave called Betru Becoming True Millennials. And this talk from President Nelson, I would say, I would describe it as a patriarchal blessing for the whole church in that it talks a lot about these concepts. And it, it, to use your words, it hits you right between the eyes. I'd like to read a little section of what President Nelson said to us. He said, a true millennial is one who has taught and did teach the gospel of Jesus Christ pre-mortally hmm. and who made covenants with our Heavenly Father there about courageous things, even morally courageous things that you would do while here on earth. A true millennial is a man or woman whom God trusted enough to send to earth during the most compelling dispensation in the history of the world. A true millennial is a man or woman who lives now to help, help prepare the people of this world for the second coming of Jesus Christ and his millennial reign. Make no mistake about it, you were born to be a true millennial. And then he gives counts. He says, learn who you really are. I love that, that, that word, learn who you really are. He says, take time to think prayerfully about these facts. Number one, you are an elect son or daughter of God. Number two, you are created in his image. Number three, you were taught in the spirit world to prepare you for anything and everything you would encounter during this latter part of these latter days. That teaching endures within you. So therefore, my first recommendation is to learn for yourselves who you really are. 
And then he gives this, that this, it made my spine tingle, that how, how powerful this next part was. He said, ask your heavenly father in the name of Jesus Christ, how he feels about you and your mission here on earth. If you ask with real intent, over time, the spirit will whisper the life-changing truth to you. Record those impressions and review them often and follow through with exactness. I promise you that when you begin to catch even a glimpse of how your heavenly father sees you and what he is counting on you to do for him, your life will never be the same. Wow. Elder Douglas Alcalister, another great talk that I just happened to listen to a few days ago. Uh, this is from a BYU-Idaho address. He gave a very similar expression. He said, that same God who brings such order to the universe and inspired the prophets, designated the time, place, and circumstances of your birth he chose your ancestors and your posterity. To the prophet Joseph Smith, the Lord said, thy days are known and thy years shall not be numbered less. God's love for you and awareness of your circumstances is of equal measure. He foreordained you to perform a mission. Nothing will bring you greater sorrow than to have father say when you return home, you didn't complete your work. I had to give part of your mission to someone else. Mm. Like I said, these these talks, and I've been seeing more and more of them coming out. Um, Elder Bangor quotes a lot from President Nelson's 2018 Hope of Israel address. Yes, yes, yes. And is. President Nelson recently gave his uh, his identity talk, talking about true identity, right? Um, child of God, child of the covenant, disciple of Christ. Yes. All of these things, and in quickly repeated succession, are heavily hitting home this, like I said, radical truth that we're telling not just the rising generation, but every generation in this dispensation, there is something unique and different and special here. When I was thinking about that and how radical this is, whereas the first song we teach our kids is I'm a child of God. The first principle missionaries teach to investigators is that God is your loving heavenly father. It's the same thing. Why do we do that? Because it completely recontextualizes mortal life. We're not, we're not observers here to be passively acted upon. We're not, we're not creations, blank slates, ready to you know, follow any one of a number, of course, of different paths in life. No, we're teaching people, you are a soldier and a child of God. You worked under the direction of Jesus to cast Satan out of heaven and shouted for joy at the plan of salvation and then made promises to come down in the last inning of the field to destroy Satan. Like this is, you signed up for this. You're not learning the gospel anew. You're learning it for the second time. You're just trying to remember what you already knew. And you're trying, you're not making new promises. You're trying to keep promises you already made eons and eons ago with billions of years at your father's knees. That completely changes how people address temptation. That changes how they address trials. That changes how they address family matters because everything completely changes. You're no longer you know, being born into this wide, scary world with no clue what's going on. We're in act two of a three-act play, and you're one of the main characters with a protagonist and a history and a script and motivations that were that were written long before you got to this point. So it's, I, the older I get, the more radical I realize that idea is. You've said some very powerful things, and we'll make sure that in the show notes that we'll have links to those talks. Because, in fact, um, I'm trying to remember if I've read that talk. I probably have, and I've probably forgotten. So I am definitely going to go back. In fact, this evening, I'm going to go back and read that from the, the, the talk on millennials, because that is powerful information. And you're absolutely right. And as Elder Bangader points out, we need to know who we are. We just really need to know. And you're absolutely right. I agree with you 100%. It changes how we accept what happens in our life. It, 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 people have faced various challenges, health challenges. Um, people have all sorts of things that invents in their life. And it's so easy to get forget that we are a child of God and that He is with us. He hasn't left us. In fact, He says He'll be our rearward, rearward and our forward. And um, yes, I've, w what you've said is just uh, right on, and I agree with that 100%.
and to get on my soapbox one moment more. Yes, go for a it. Lot of, a lot of people in my generation are very obsessed with this idea of personal authority and authenticity. And so they hear talks from President Oaks and Elder Hall and the rest saying, hey, keep your covenants, wear your garments, do the things that you know are expected of you as a covenant-keeping member of the church. I say, well, that's just not me. You know, I, I appreciate that that works for the church, but I need to be true to myself. The whole message of the gospel is, do you know who you are? If you were being true to yourself, you would keep your covenants zealously because that's the promise that you made. You were zealous in the cause of righteousness before coming here. You kicked Satan out with your testimony. So yes, we are inviting you not to be just true to the church, true to the Lord, true to the servants. Be true to yourself and the promises you've made. Once people can realize who they were, a lot of the decisions in life, a lot of the decisions of discipleship become so much easier. Yes, and President Nelson just recently even talked about that. And I was just thinking, part of being a member of the church is getting to a point where we no longer do our will, but his will. And when we do that, that's what changes us. I I was studying the other day, and, and I journal while I'm studying, and, and I, I really thought about people need to understand that that when we that, that when we submit to him, as Brother Elder Maxwell said, the only thing we can submit to him, sacrifice, is our will. And the world So I think we truly possess, yeah. Yes. And the world thinks that by doing that, then you can't be yourself. But if when we do that, well, okay, let me back up. They think that by giving our will to him, our Heavenly Father, that we then don't have any freedom. We just do what he says. He says, jump. How many, how many inches do you want me to jump? But when we truly give our will to him, we have more freedom and blessings than we can, I think, I don't even think we can understand all the blessings and the freedom that we have because we do that. Yeah, it's not Jesus that takes away our agency when we follow him. That, that, that's the other guy. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's the one that guaranteed everyone would make it to the end. Well, I'm looking here further. Um, toward the end, he says, My young brothers and sisters, as you protect the private times of your life. That is so important. And he tells a story in here that he was mowing the lawn. His dad pulls him aside and says, Protect your silent moments. Uh, your private, yeah, your private moments. And I think, wow, that is so important. We need to act when we're alone and be true to our covenants when we're alone, even when nobody's watching or hearing us, at least mortals. <laughs> Heavenly Father is, and I believe we have guardian angels, and they're obviously seeing what's going on. But he says, my my young brothers and sisters, as you protect the private times of your life with wholesome recreation, listening to uplifting music, reading the scriptures, having regular meaningful prayer, and making efforts to receive and ponder your patriarchal blessing, you will receive revelation. And that goes back to what you said quite a, quite a few minutes ago, that we will receive revelation. And for members to know, we are getting to the point where your patriarchal blessing will be in the gospel library. It, it's going to happen really? very soon. It's going to happen very soon. And oh, so that's been be one of my feature quests for 10 years, man. <laughs> I want to highlight and bookmark and cross link and reference that thing. Well, actually, I already have mine in. Of course, I have the alpha versions and the beta versions. But um, before that, I. I copied and pasted my page called Blessing into a notebook in the Gospel As Library. a notebook? Yeah, yeah into I a thought notebook. of doing that. And then I've highlighted and underlined and everything in there. So, but uh, yeah, it's going to be readily available very, very soon. So, um, because... Your patriarchal you blessing... You heard it here first, everyone. Yeah, you heard it here first. Your, your patriarchal blessing it is a tremendous blessing. And we need to read it often. We've been told to read it often. And so the church is going to make sure that it's available right there for you to pop up anytime you want and, and understand who you are. That is a great way to help strengthen those, those private moments. You know, when he, when he gave that counsel about private moments, I thought, boy, doesn't that cut against what we hear in the therapy gospel nowadays? 
you know, we, we seem to get this idea from, uh, again, I call it the therapy gospel, but it's, it's an idea that's very popular in therapeutic circles now. And I start to see it around members of the church say, well, you know, your actions are important, but your thoughts, not so much because that's, that's my domain, right? That, that's where I get to be me. Oh. And all the voices and all the influences and all the feelings and all of the thoughts that I have, they're not good. They're not bad. They're just, they're just me. Right. And it's all a part of me and it's all okay. And I can listen to all those voices, even the angry ones, even the lustful ones, even all these different things, as long as I just control my actions. That goes against what Jesus taught. That goes against what Elder Banger says. No, those private moments, you're, or as Elder President Packer said, your mind is a stage and you, you may not control who gets on the stage, but you control who stays. Yes. And you control what part they play in what you choose to produce. You let those unrighteous thoughts, those unrighteous feelings, and there are unrighteous thoughts and feelings. They are not all created equal. The devil is at work trying to lob things over the wall at us. Those are unrighteous thoughts and feelings, and we have a duty to treat them as if that were unrighteous words or unrighteous actions as well. There are no truly private moments. Yeah, absolutely. I Sometimes a thought will come in my head and I immediately say, stop. <laughs> Because I, I don't want that thought to go to go any further. Absolutely, in fact, uh, the scriptures are full of verses that talk about we're going to be judged by our thoughts. And of course, Matthew five, the Sermon on the Mount. You know, to even look at a woman um, in an immoral way is is a sin. So, but but I haven't I haven't heard. I, of course, you're a different generation, many years before mine. I haven't heard that um, what you were just saying that people are th thinking that their thoughts are okay and that it's the physical actions. I I haven't heard that, so I've learned something new tonight. It's it's a scary world. A lot of the influences that are pulling my friends away from the church are scary, but <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> I mean, it's, let's just say, core horror is very strong among my generation right now. I wasn't aware of that. I really wasn't. Now, how old are you? Or at least give us a decade. What, what decade are you in? I'm 34. You're 34. All right. I'm 76. So there, <laughs> there, there's a little bit of spread there. <laughs> Double that and add a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, and of course, uh, all my friends that are older, and so, so I've learned something tonight that uh, your generation, uh, core horror, is among them. Well, my my uh, my wife tells me I'm 85 at heart. So, oh, <laughs> she says I'm a I'm a regular old curmudgeon that was born 50 years later than I should have been. <laughs> well, there are advantages to getting old. I, by the way, were you able to watch uh, President Nelson's birthday? Yes, All right. Yes. I watched his. I, I watched his one minute version. Which a little side note on that: he finished. Most people didn't catch this. He finished with an apostolic blessing. Yes, he which did. I talked about how the brethren are bringing up the pre mortal life and forward nation patriarchal blessings more and more often. That's another thing where very recently, just the past twelve years or so, there's a skyrocketing increase of apostolic blessings. Actually charted it over time recently. You get like a few from Brigham Young, a few here and there, and then all of a sudden, especially around the time that President Nelson became president of the church, you're getting apostolic blessings left and right. Mm -hmm. And people don't often realize that, according to Lord Holland, when an apostolic blessing is given, it is as if their hands are on your head. Mm -hmm. So when I watch President Nelson's birthday address that he finished with an apostolic blessing, I got a blessing from the prophet today. How cool is that? Yeah, I agree. Ab absolutely. Well, I watched it. I watched the whole thing. And I I watched it upstairs because <clears throat> I was doing something. And uh, my wife watched it downstairs. But anyway, when it was over. I went downstairs. And said, How many Kleenexes did you go through? And she said, I didn't go through any Kleenexes. I said, I went through at least six Kleenexes <laughs> while I was watching that thing. <laughs> Tears you were just coming in front like of your crazy. Wife, so I did see little clips of him tossing balloons around. Yeah, yeah. that's just fun. Yeah, he. I, I told my wife, I said, if I could just be one percent, two percent of what he is, I'd be happy. Mm -hmm. He is just the legacy he has left, and the kind of man he is is just unbelievable. And and that doesn't mean the others, um, uh, the the other um, fourteen of them, aren't also of that caliber, but um, 
just they're great 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 men and i don't know why people don't want to listen to them and and follow what they say because they understand they really understand well in closing do you have any other comments um regarding elder bangator no it, it is an absolutely beautiful talk about the pre-mortal existence, about foreordination, about protecting the quiet times in our life. And like I said, being honest, not just to God, but also to yourself and who you really are, your pre-mortal self. And he finishes with this beautiful promise. He said, our Father in heaven will answer your prayers, especially your prayers offered during those private times of your life. He will reveal to you your foreordained gifts and talents and you will feel his love envelop you if you will sincerely ask and genuinely desire to know. Yes. Most people are not asking. No. Most people are taking on the identity, the what I would say the everyday identity that they feel they have been given by others, and they're not stopping and taking a moment and finding out who they really are. If people would do that, it no force on earth would be able to stop the membership of this church. Oh, I absolutely agree. Amen. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Conference Talk Podcast. This episode, we discuss Elder Bangerter's address, for ordained to serve. If you enjoyed this episode, give us a five-star rating anywhere you get the podcast. That's right. And check out our website, conferencetalk.org, where you can follow us on social media, drop us a comment, check out the show notes, learn more about us, your hosts. If you want to follow me, I'm available at my website, The Busy Latter-day Saint. And me, also busy, but without the cool website name, I'm Matthew Watkins, and you can find me at powerinthebook.com. But while we always appreciate new followers, it's better to follow the prophet and apostles themselves. That's right. Even though we love speaking about the church and our leaders, we do not speak for them. Everything said on this podcast represents our own personal opinions. So join us next time in making every weekend conference weekend on the Conference Talk podcast.